to um, begin with the beginning because, um, of course, the theme is um, about memory and matter. It's very much a Bergsonian theme uh, this year. Uh, and talking about memory, you have just recently written an autobiography, um, right. which uh, is uh, connected, of course, to memory. Yes. And I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about this autobiography and how it all began, how you came to philosophy and how philosophy came to you. Um, well, yes, indeed. I, I So I wrote this uh, this autobiography, Le Fago de ma Mémoire, is the title in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in French, where uh, basically I revisited what I, my, 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 my trajectory and I, this was a very uh, a useful exercise of memory. This is the very first time I just looked at my own trajectory and, uh, and I learned a lot in, in doing that. So I was not uh, uh, very keen on writing this at first. It took really some convincing uh, for me to, to, to decide to to engage in this endeavor, but now that it is done, I'm very happy I did it. And I uh, 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 feel that it has changed a lot uh, uh, for me. So uh, yes, and so uh, any reflection on, on memory and the significance of memory uh, became somehow clearer to me. I used to, uh, uh, I'm very Bergsonian as you know, in my approach of philosophy in general, uh, memory in particular, the idea that memory is something that you are always writing in the present. Memory is not something past that you, you go back to revisit, but it is something that really you activate at the very moment when you are uh, reminiscing in the present. And it is uh, something that serves the present, so to say. And I could say that with the writing of this book, I had that experience firsthand in a way. So this is how I would describe uh, 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 the experience that it meant for me when I was writing Le Fago de ma, de ma Memoire. It's of course so fascinating that you studied both mathematics and uh, philosophy and that these two interests um, found a union in actually your work, bring together philosophy and algebraic uh, logic. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems so important that actually for you, philosophy and mathematics are not contradictory. Yes, uh, uh, actually, I, as I say in the, in the book, when I first uh, uh, came to Paris, uh, after I finished high school in, uh, in Senegal, in Dakar, I did not know what I wanted really to study. And this happens to uh, everybody, I think many uh, young people at 17 or 18 have uh, undergone that same experience. In my case, it was really two diff very different paths that I was hesitating between. Uh, one was a path that would have led me to studying mathematics and becoming an engineer probably. And the other one, which is the one I eventually followed, was the one that led me to, uh, to philosophy. And uh, uh, it was a very difficult choice to, to make, but somehow, somehow, I would say that uh, uh, politics, what was my politics at that time, I was very much influenced by a philosopher such as Jean-Paul Sartre, but also some form of family background. I have always had, as I say in the book, this kind of, philosophical conversations with my, with my father in particular, who was uh, really my, my first mentor and my first teacher in, in, in philosophy. So uh, that would explain in retrospect why my choice was the choice of philosophy. But as you have mentioned, in a way, uh, uh, attraction the attraction of mathematics never left me because after a while, I uh, had the opportunity and the time to uh, uh, um, resume some study of mathematics yeah. through logic and, and algebra. And my dissertation in particular was a dissertation in the history of mathematics in the exploration, in the examination of universal algebra, of the algebra of 
uh, of logic, Boolean algebra, and my first two books are in that particular field also of algebraic logic. So uh, in a way I found in the end, uh, uh, the right path to reconcile uh, my uh, uh, inclination towards mathematics and my passion for uh, for philosophy. Now, also, um, you mentioned that your father was somehow a first mentor, and I wanted to ask you who would be other mentors in in philosophy. And I, I thought, I mean, less in terms of a genealogy, <clears throat> because. Um, uh, Alexis Pauling Gams wrote this wonderful book uh, about Sylvia Winter. It's called Dab. And she says it's actually not necessarily about Sylvia Winter being an influence on, on her in terms of genealogy, but it's more about her thinking with Sylvia Winter. So, in that sense, the question is less a question of geology, but maybe more who are the, the philosophers who were your mentors, the philosophers with whom you're, you're thinking? Well, I have, I have once written that my, uh, 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 my interest in the philosophy of Muhammad Iqbal, the, 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 the Indian poet, philosopher, and statesman Muhammad Iqbal came from the fact that he taught me, if I can quote myself, I wrote that he taught me what it is that I was thinking. He taught me my own thought. And this corresponds somehow to what you just said about what uh, uh, a mentor, truly means and what it means to be thinking with somebody. So I would uh, uh, take the same formula that I use to say that Muhammad Iqbal is truly the one who taught me what uh, my own thinking uh, uh, is. And can you talk a little bit more about what, um, how you connect with Muhammad Iqbal? And also, of course, I'm very interested in this idea of um, poets, philosophers, artists, and in your case, philosophers, of course, um, also taking office, actually going into politics, because of course, there's a long history of that with poetry. Um, I was friendly with Sheslav uh, Milos, the poet from Krakow. He was a cultural attache. Many uh, writers, Latin American writers, from Octavio Paz to Carlos Fuentes, whom I also interviewed, also worked either as ministers of culture or as cultural attaches of, the, of their country. And you, mm -hmm. like Iqbal, have actually very early in your life, um, you've gone into politics. Uh, yes, well, for, first of all, let me, let me say a, a word or two about Muhammad Iqbal that I mentioned. Muhammad yeah. Iqbal is this Indian uh, poet, philosopher, statesman, as I said, who uh, was uh, uh, really very influential in my, in my own thinking. He, he, because he, is essentially the philosopher of a modern uh, Islam. That's one thing. Second thing, he was himself very much in conversation with a philosopher who has exercised a, a great influence also on, on my thinking, and that is the French philosopher Henri Bergson. Bergson and Iqbal were very much uh, uh, in conversation uh, both in their writings and in person, they, they, did, uh, they did meet. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, there is also this connection through Bergson with uh, uh, Senegalese philosopher, poet, and statesman, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who was very much influenced by, by Bergson and who also uh, 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 considered uh, Iqbal as a very important figure of uh, of Islam, although Senghor himself was a Catholic, but he thought that uh, uh, Iqbal's philosophy uh, and approach to uh, Islamic thought was truly uh, uh, the, the the way to go and uh, a very uh, the, the way to 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 reconcile the Islamic religion with modern times. So this is one aspect. Now to talk about uh, my incursion in, in, in politics. Uh, 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 this happened when I uh, was uh, uh, in Senegal, I was teaching at the university. And there was a point when, there was a point when uh, 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 there was a kind of political opening 
in Senegal when the, the president then, Abdou Diouf, who was the socialist president, uh, um, um, sorry. Uh, um, so the president, you talked about the president of that time in Senegal. Yes, the president Abdou Diouf, socialist yeah. president of Senegal, uh, invited me to serve as his uh, uh, cultural advisor, his advisor in, uh, in, for culture and also for education. And uh, uh, the understanding was that I would not uh, 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 leave university. I was very much an academic. I planned to, to remain an academic. I was not fully embracing 100% a political career, but I was open to, to helping and serving my country in that position. So these were uh, six years, this happened in 1993. These were six years, very intense because I was teaching at the university and at the same time I was serving as the cultural and educational advisor uh, uh, to the president of, of Senegal. Uh, so yes, so you could imagine what kind of, of days I would have uh, uh, and how intense my work was uh, at that time. But I, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Uh, that is the closest I have been to uh, uh, to politics in my in my in my own country. So this ended in year two thousand uh, when uh, uh, Abdou Youf lost the elections and was uh, uh, replaced by a more um, on the right uh, uh, president, uh, Ablaywad. And this is also the year when I myself uh, uh, left Senegal to teach, to take a position in the US when I became a professor of philosophy uh, in Chicago at Northwestern University. And there was of course also a um... I think uh, if you know, from uh, from Senegal, who was who took over the UNESCO at some point, no? Because Edouard Glissant wrote for the magazine of the UNESCO, and he told me that it was actually uh, somebody from Senegal who took over the UNESCO at that time. Yes, yes. Uh, Senegal had uh, Amadou Mokhtar Mbo elected as the director general of UNESCO. And, uh, and so this was a very big deal. It was very important. This was the first time that an African was the head of, of uh, an international organization as important as UNESCO uh, was. And uh, by the way, uh, very recently, I participated in the celebration of the 100th uh, birthday of Amadou Mokhtar Mo. He is now 100, believe it or not, and he is in, in, in good shape intellectually. He participated in the celebration of his own uh, anniversary. And this was really a great moment of celebration in Senegal. Beautiful, thank you very much. And before we talk more about Bergson, about Metro and memory, <clears throat> and the actual theme of the Engadin Art Talks this year, I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned Maud Iqbal, and this brings us, of course, also to the question of of philosophy and the kind of canon of philosophy, you, you often said that the canon of philosophy in the 19th century has been oversimplified, that the whole idea that we went from pre-Socrates to Socrates to then post-Socrates to Aristoteles to Stoics to Neoplatonic and then to the modern um, is something which of course uh, misses out completely on Islamic philosophy would miss out on the importance of someone like Mohammed Iqbal. And that's, of course, something which is highly interesting also to talk about in the art world, because a similar thing, of course, happened with art history. There has been a complete oversimplification of art history, excluding many, many pioneering artists uh, from different parts of the world. And you have early on actually um, uh, written a very different philosophy, bringing in also uh, protagonists and, and, and philosophers like Mohammed Iqbal. Can you talk a little bit about um, about this and, and how it actually was only in the 19th century and above all in the 19th century that this oversimplification uh, and exclusion uh, happened? Yes, and the reason why I, I, I consider that this happened very late because uh, uh, 
one could believe that this idea that philosophy is quintessentially Western and that it has always been considered as a Western uh, uh, discipline uh, uh, was an old notion. No, that's not true. If you look at the history of philosophy, the Greek philosophers never thought themselves that uh, philosophy belonged to them. Uh, Plato uh, was the first one to talk about the influence of, of Egypt or other places on, 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 on Greece, how Greece learned from other cultures and other, other people. Uh, if, even if you take a philosopher of absolute uh, uh, beginning, such as Descartes, Descartes would be a philosopher who recognized that the very yeah. matrix of his thought was the science of algebra and that the science of algebra, as its name indicates, is or was at his time a foreign science. Leibniz thought that uh, philosophy should learn from China and Chinese writing in particular. So the openness of uh, uh, philosophy to other areas, the fact that, for example, Thomas Aquinas would call uh, someone, uh, a Muslim philosopher such as Averroes, uh, the commentator. And this dialogue uh, uh, f- uh, um, between philosophers from one cultural area to another, or from one religious uh, uh, tradition to another, etc., was quite normal. Uh, uh, very recently, a French philosopher, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Roger Paul Droit, who is also this journalist who writes about philosophy in the uh, daily uh, Le Monde, uh, wrote a book in which he said that this simplification and the decision to make history uh, uh, to make the history of philosophy the history of Europe and only of what Husserl has called the European humanity was, uh, uh, he, he wrote that the philosophers responsible for that were the, the three H's as he called them. The first H being Hegel, the second H being Husserl and the third H being Heidegger. So, uh, uh, and when Hegel uh, wrote, for example, declared in his lectures on the, on the history, uh, on the philosophy of history, uh, that uh, philosophy was quintessentially European and reconstructed the history of philosophy as a Western history starting with, uh, uh, in Greece and being continued in, continued in uh, uh, European uh, antiquity, then medieval times, then uh, uh, modern time, etc. Uh, uh, his, his lectures were, uh, um, were delivered in the early 19th century. And it is not coincidental that, for example, in 1830, while he was in the middle of those lectures, the conquest of Algiers by France happened. So this construction itself of philosophy as quintessentially European is connected to colonialism and this sense of European exceptionalism that would be the justification for European colonialism. And so uh, uh, now decolonizing the history of philosophy is important because uh, the history of philosophy needs to be pluralized again. One does not understand, for example, medieval philosophy if one doesn't see medieval philosophy as a conversation happening in between philosophers from the Christian Latin word, the Jewish uh, uh, tradition and word, and the Islamic tradition. And so uh, uh, this simplification just ignores the richness and the multiplicity and the pluralism of, uh, uh, of uh, the history of philosophy, it is uh, um, important that we uh, uh, reconstruct today the history of philosophy by uh, uh, showing how uh, many philosophical traditions actually uh, exist and are important and uh, um, enlighten us on the very history of our own discipline. Help us understand, for example, more fully and uh, have a a better and more accurate image 
of what medieval philosophy uh, uh, was. 